Happy Ocean Friday, everyone. I am so excited to be here with Ian Tibbetts, and uh, he is all the way in Australia, and he's actually a whole day ahead of us. <laughs> Welcome, Ian. How are you doing? I should say morning. Oh, that's okay. Good morning. Oh, well, yeah, no, it is morning here. We're nine o'clock in the morning. I'm not sure what time it is where you are, but um, uh, maybe you're yesterday, as you suggest, so. Yes, it's Good 7 p.m. here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, whoa. Okay. Good evening. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I was really excited that uh, you responded to my email because I learned about you. I had uh, taken a Cornell online shark ecology class that was free that they had done for Shark Week. And you were in it speaking and I thought, this guy's super, super awesome and cool. I need to send him an email and see if we can <laughs> interview him for the Fuzzy Sharks channel. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> You're very kind. Yeah, that's the course that Willie Beam has set up. So, yeah, I've, I've been um, visiting Cornell for many years. I love that part of the country, uh, southern New York State. Beautiful. So, yeah. It, it really is. And, and you're yeah. part of the course, which we'll, we can get into that later, but it was really informational what you had to add to it. So I appreciated that. Thank you. Um, you are the associate professor of the University of Queensland, Australia, correct? Correct. Yeah, we're based in Brisbane. Um, and I'm now sitting on my back deck in a place called Indrapilly in Brisbane, which is an Aboriginal word meaning gully of leeches. Okay. So <laughs> I'm talking to you from the gully of leeches. <laughs> I, I love that. That is awesome. <laughs> so if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about your background, I know that you uh, studied zoology and marine biology. Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, I saw in your, your bio that you focused on blennies yeah I, well, and you're gonna yeah. have to i know okay. my audience isn't gonna really understand that term so no. i would love for you to share about your background and yeah and what you studied well it's it kind of started so i was at school and i had a fabulous biology teacher who took us on a field trip to a place called plymouth which will resonate with folks in the u.s because plymouth rock and all that yeah. you know so we went to the departure site for the Plymouth boat. And I did a, we were allowed to do a little research project. And I did it on blennies, these little fish that live in rock pools. And I'd been seeing them for years as a kid. So I grew up in the Southwest of England on the coast. My mother loved the sea. So I spent a lot of time on the, on the beach rather than lying in the sun, I was hunting around rock pools. So I got to this field trip and she let me do this research project, looking at the gut contents, what was inside them, what they were feeding on. And that was the first research project I've ever done. And that was at school. And I'm still in contact with her. So a lovely person. She's getting quite old now, as you might imagine from this. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so that was school. So yeah, and then, yeah, I, had, I just have this fascination for little fish and how they feed and all this sort of stuff. And yeah, and then kind of got diverted into sharks by some of my students' enthusiasms, you know. So I'm all about little fish and they all want to study big fish. So it gets kind of crazy. <laughs> Well, and we'll talk about later that, you know, sharks come in all different sizes. So that, that is a plus. So were you always really uh, fascinated and passionate about water? Like as a, as a young kid, were you always kind of drawn to it? What inspired you to, to go into zoology? Oh, like, uh, yeah. I was just like, I was nuts over it. I, I learned to read at a fairly early age. My mum uh, is an artist and was an art teacher. And she won a competition when she was at college. And the prize was a book by Jacques Cousteau called The Silent World. And yeah. it was about the early days of scuba diving when he and Alexandre Dumas, I think it was, were experimenting with compressed air underwater breathing. This is during the end of the Second World War. Yeah. And the images were wonderful. The, the, the verbal, the, the sort of written descriptions of marine life were wonderful. And I was kind of matching this up with the shore <clears throat> I was visiting and it all kind of came together. So I like ran the nature table. I bred newts. I, you know, just got crazy from there, really. <laughs> I, I love that. I had no idea that your mom was an artist. I mean, as an artist myself. She I is love an artist. That, yeah, she's very good. Yeah, that yeah. connection. What does is, what is she focus in? Uh, she, well, she likes, I mean, she does a whole range of stuff. She's uh, watercolors, I think is her preferred medium. She does oils. I used to do a bit of oil painting myself, but um, she does a lot of watercolors. She's uh, in some south devon guild of artists and does displays and 
my sister's a real, you know, like a professional artist. Um, and I was the one that kind of failed, you know. <laughs> I drew pictures of ducks instead of applying myself as I should have done. <laughs> <laughs> nope, that's just, you were just being creative. That's all. Yeah, you're very generous. <laughs> Well, I, I love that that connection. Um, so, mm. so now that you um, are an associate professor, you know what does a day in the life of Ian Tibbetts look like? You know, I know looking at your bio, you've written a lot of papers. You're a professor. I'm sure that you do some field work, and you're you're in Australia now. So, what what does a day in your life look like? Oh my word! I mean, if you tried to make a hybrid day, probably about seventy percent of it would be spent in front of a computer um writing stuff editing stuff and now with you know during covid it's also zoom meetings with people so yesterday i had what was i zooming with yesterday i think it was oh no yeah so california um i had another a kid who was at purdue university which is in indiana we had a zoom yeah. chat about when maybe he, he likes sharks and he wants to come over and do some work so yeah so zooming around a bit um saturday i was over on a nice island near here talking to people about um seabirds and you know it's it's very diverse <laughs> it's like yeah <coughs> there's no there's no like typical day it's a mixture of you know whatever folks want to do next so yeah yeah and zooming's pretty great in terms of being versatile to move around chat with you and you know um so here i am in the morning on whatever day it is doing an interview with you which is lovely so you know i like no my days my days are never, never boring um a lot of it focuses on writing and science so you know talking to my students and getting things sorted out so it's pretty exciting that's great i i love that do you do you find that because of covid and this you know new new life that everyone's deeming you know, with zooming that you're interacting with more people than you did previously yeah. like across the globe yeah, I'm a bit of a hermit, really. So, and I, I used to travel a lot before we weren't allowed to travel anymore. Yeah. Um, so if you think about the amount of time that sort of vacuums up while you're in, you know, going to an airport, waiting in the airport, flying somewhere, you know, you might, you might do an hour or two hours meeting, and but it takes, you know, two or three days to get that sorted out. And now it's like instantaneous. I can, you know, stop chatting to you and then, you know, talk to somebody else in another part of the world, you know? So, yeah it's COVID is a horrible horrible thing but i think it's made us reevaluate how we sort of organize our lives a little bit so yes yeah i'm i'm trying to look at the positives at the moment so yeah yeah i i really i appreciate that because i've been trying to do the same and i think a lot of us are you know really valuing that and then also you know what priorities are you know yeah yeah absolutely what, life is I, short yeah. and yeah you know we have to make the most of it for sure yeah Vito, Vito Brevis. Yes. Ask long of Vito Brevis, which means uh, <laughs> life is short, art is long. So yeah, I'm with the art side of things. Yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. That's 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 great. Well, I'm glad to, glad to hear that because I this, you know, it gives us this opportunity, like you were just saying, to connect. Um, mm -hmm. So speaking of you know your diverse day, uh, all your papers are also very diverse, bouncing around different topics and studying different. Oh yeah, well. <laughs> What is your personal favorite? And you don't have to say sharks. Don't feel pressured. No, but... no, 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 no. Good point. No. <laughs> um, I'm a functional morphologist at heart. So I like looking at the structure of an organism and observing an organism and working at how it does stuff and how that fits into its evolutionary story. Yeah. So, yeah. and my PhD was on things called garfish, which you would probably call ballyhoo in the US, a little yeah. fish they use for bait and that sort of stuff, but they're really interesting animals. So they're, they're, they're my passion, but in a practical sense, I have to do, I, I, you know, I love working with students and my priority has to be their career outcomes, not my passions. So uh, that's why my research background is, and publications are so diverse <clears throat> from, you know, uh, you know, the gut, gut contents of little fish, like the blennies we were talking about earlier, yeah. to the biology and migration of things like tiger sharks and, and uh, giant hammerheads and, you know, a bunch of stuff, as you say. But, I, you know, I, 
I'm just curious about stuff. So, you know. Yeah, I'm, I can't I, imagine how much stuff is in your brain. I mean, I'm sure that you. Well, I mean, it's, it's forced all the hair out of my head. So that's a, <laughs> Well, full. clearly that means I need more in my brain. So. No, 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 no. You're good. You're good. You got a few years to pick all the rubbish up that I carry around in my head. But yeah, so, you know, things like electroreception. There's a, a paper that we published a couple of weeks ago that came out in the the publication virology about viruses which is kind of topical yeah yeah viruses in in sea cucumbers and other things so yeah i'm just curious and if people want to ask a sensible question i'm happy to help them answer it so yeah i just i just love life it's great you know, that's so, that's fantastic so because really i mean if nature really shows us that every single part of the ecosystem is important so mm -hmm. doing a paper and a study on sea cucumbers, someone might be like, oh, well, it's not really flashy or really glamorous. But when you get down to the science of it, it's absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. Like they're needed. You know, every part of the ecosystem is important. Yeah, and we're very fortunate. We have people, I'm not say as crazy as I am, but as passionate as I am about so many different groups of organisms, relationships between organisms, but you know, the human race has it pretty well covered in terms of its ability to look and ask questions, sensible questions about yeah. about living things and living systems. So, yeah, I think uh, hats off to those others that work on some of the more obscure things. Um, my kids asked me so years ago, they said, you know, you do the science stuff, are you famous? And I said, well, there's probably about four people in the world that would be interested in the sort of papers I produce. This is when I was talking, you know, studying the ballyhoo things and uh yeah they would yeah so yeah it's not a it's not a pathway to fame and fortune but yeah. it's a pathway to a lot of personal satisfaction i think that's the best way to encapsulate it yeah. yeah it's it's about um you know fortune and thriving in life isn't always a financial thing it's about being oh, personally yeah, no. fulfilled and if you're per personally fulfilled and at the end of the day you are happy and you know, have that glow about you because you love what you do. You know, sometimes that's that's more important money. You know, as long as you can pay no, your no, no, I think, over your head and can yeah. feed yourself and drink water, then you know that's what matters in life. Yeah, you're golden. A lot of people don't even have that, so you know we got to yeah. be thankful for those things we have. My my own family are all builders, so my destiny was to become a house builder. So <laughs> I kind of broke the mold a bit. Um, maybe to the disappointment of my family but you know i'm doing what i do and i'm passionate about it and i'm keen to help others on that path yeah. well you're just building in a different way you're you're helping mm. build other people's knowledge and in passion and inspiration so you're a builder <laughs> no thank you that's very kind that's very generous yeah i did build a research station along the way that was kind of fun so yeah that yeah. that's awesome that counts yeah i guess yeah but yeah, definitely looking for my with my builder's hat on when I was doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, where was that located that you did that? Uh, that's on a place called Minjeraba, um, which is an island very close to Brisbane, where I am. Yeah. Uh, it's it's uh, European name is North Stradbroke Island. Okay. And it's a beautiful place, lovely place, but it's it's got a wonderful community over there, and yeah. So I saw a research station that was a bit run down. Someone said that you can be the director of it for a while. And I thought, okay, well, I'll go rebuild it. So <clears throat> with a great friend of mine, Jack Greenwood, another associate professor, we worked together on that project and managed to get a research station built. So there's now a big thriving research station over there. It's cool. That's that's awesome to, to, to contribute in so many ways. I mean, to basically it, see something it, and say, yeah, we're going to rehabilitate, rehabilitate that. And like, yeah, it's not. It. And working with industry to get the money together to do it was was also a learning a learning pathway and yeah so yeah that was exciting so the things you do along the way which are not you know folks may may think that scientists just you know beaver away at their science there's lots of other things they do as well there's a lot of, there's a lot of forms we have to fill out there's a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of processes to go to and and also things we have to do in public so the other thing is the side of public speaking, communication, those yeah. sorts of things. If you can only talk to yourself, then you will have very lonely conversations. So being able to talk to a range of folks from different walks of life is important. And I'm a great believer in polishing one's communication skills to assist with that process. 
yeah, that is, that's very, very important because it mm. helps not only inform and educate others, but it is another way of inspiring them. You know, if you can communicate with them and get your ideas and, and information across, it, it helps give them excitement about the topic too. And have a conversation with everyone, you know, so, you know, I, I'm, I've got a couple of grandchildren. Um, I'm a father of four children and speaking to children is important. All right. Yeah. So, and having real conversations with them because they are little, they're little, you know, little, little humans who are sponging this soaking stuff up and yeah. some of the most wonderful interactions have been when I'm doing walks on the shore for the public and some of the wonderful interactions with, with, with children who are discovering this environment for the first time. Right. Yeah. So most, you know, often kids go to the beach. I don't know what they do. They go, I think they go lie on sand or something or other, or their parents do. And the opportunity to dig into the sand, dig into the yeah. mud and then describe what's going on really it's wonderful seeing their fascination and they're so eager going off and catching little animals for me to identify. <laughs> like, yeah, trying to keep, trying to keep up with them is difficult. You know, <laughs> what's this? And I, oh yeah. Well, it's one of those, you know? So yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah, no, it's a great deal of fun. So I, I enjoy that side of it. And I like teaching a lot. So, you know, my other hat besides my research hat is my teaching hat. And I, yeah, I get, I have a lot of fun teaching students. Um, yeah. It's wonderful. It's a privilege. I, and there's, you know, being, I've, I've taught a little bit in, in my lifetime and it's, it's very rewarding, you know, to, cause you're also learning from the students. I'm sure, you know, it is that oh, yeah. give and take. Yeah. And I know times that I've worked with children, they remind me what it was like before we all became tainted as an adult and got stressed and got overloaded and they just have so much <laughs> joy and they see things with such like yeah. awe and, and grandeur, and I, I love that about them. They're just so and they're inquisitive. And their questions aren't filtered either. So, you know, as adults, we filter a lot of the curiosity we have yeah. by not wishing to sound stupid. Yes. But children will just ask you direct questions and you, whoa, okay, all right. <laughs> now that, that deserves a direct answer. What am I gonna come up with? So, yeah, I, yeah that, that sort of unfettered, unbounded curiosity is a, a wonderful thing and yeah I, I just you know i'm just sad that some children are in a situation where they're not able to experience that you know so yeah. Anyway, so yeah so your mission is good <laughs> well well thank you i i really do appreciate that and i think you know i try to channel my inner child because i my background is is art as well you know i'm not a marine biologist and i'll be the first to admit that I am still learning. I'm learning every single day. And I have that art brain where when I try to remember like marine biology terms or the technical terms, I just, I just can't, you know what I mean? So I love being able to connect with people like you that, uh, that can educate. And so I know my audience will really, uh, really appreciate this interview. So speaking of that, Australia obviously has sharks. So what can you tell us about, um, um. Australia and specifically the shark populations there, you know, what main species are there and, and small and large, because I know, like we had said before, a lot of people are caught up on the large species, but there's a lot of small sharks that make a big, big impact on the environment. Yeah, there are. Good question. So where I'm sitting now is near the Brisbane river. Um, if I was a bit younger and fitter, I could probably throw a rock into the Brisbane river. It's an estuary that flows into Morton Bay and Morton Bay opens up the South Pacific Ocean and perhaps the most numerous and widely distributed shark on the planet is the bull shark and we have bull sharks um, in the Brisbane River the females at a size of I think we're not metric are we so you know females of a size of six to eight feet long will swim up the Brisbane River give birth to little baby sharks they give live birth and those baby sharks feed on mullet up in the freshwater systems here so i could get <clears throat> get in my car drive for about 20 minutes go to a place called colleges crossing on the brisbane river so those of you with google maps can follow along you can find it by just finding brisbane and then going up the river yes colleges crossing is a beautiful place okay so there's eucalypts around there you know gum trees koalas little possums and kangaroos hopping around oh. 
and down where the river is, it's lovely clear water, it's beautiful and peaceful, but there's a sign there saying beware of sharks. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, in, in bullshit. So they're, they're on the, sorry, carry on. Oh, no, no, go ahead. So they're kind of the big side of things. The other side of things are the, the smaller sharks that I work on with my students. So there's one I mentioned in the Cornell course on sharks, which I did with Willie Bemis, that talks about this little shark that lives in reef systems called the epaulette shark. And it's only a foot and a half long, but it is a tough little customer. It's a <laughs> remarkable thing. And they, they um, so they're different. So bull sharks are what we call viviparous. So they give birth to live young. Whereas the little little sharks I'm talking about, the epaulette sharks, are ovoviv sorry, uh, oviparous. So they give birth, they they sort of lay eggs, and then the baby shark develops in the egg and then hatches out outside yeah, of the mother. And they're called mermaid purses, correct? They're yeah, like that's right, mermaid purses. That's right. Yeah. So skates and rays and whole, uh, skates, um, which are like a like a stingray, um, they do the same sort of thing. So they pop out these little little mermaid purses, and then the baby baby ray skate whatever hatches out of those so those those little sharks are really diverse and because they they lay eggs yeah. and because when the young hatch they stay very close to the reef there's not the dispersal is limited all right so the the distance over which the shark can roam is limited so if we take something like a bull shark which has a global distribution yeah and the adults are very mobile they can go in fresh water they can go in fully marine water and swim wherever they want You've got a species of shark that's globally distributed with the little tiny sharks because of their limited dispersal, they can't spread out and share their genetic information. Speciation tends to be much higher, right? So the number of species, their diversity is much greater. And that's some of the things we're working on at the moment with a, a re related shark, which um, we, we're working on the South Pacific and we, we think we're close to renaming a particular species um, based on that work that we're doing, so, yeah. That yeah. is really, really amazing. That's yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, you know, the great thing about nature is it doesn't matter how long you look at it, there are always more questions, right? So, yes. you know, as we, you know, I don't know, you know, I, when I started work as a scientist, when I was doing my PhD, I would visit the library and I'd go to the shelves where they have, um, indexes or indices of published work. And if you went back to the 1920s, the, the, the volumes were like this large. And then as you get toward, as we got towards the 80s, so there were multiple volumes on the shelves. And now yeah. I doubt you'd be able to fit them in the library because we keep on doing more work, more research, then we keep on finding out more things. And it's just, yeah, it's a gift that never, never stops giving really, science and nature. Which is great. And that's why, we ha that's why we have to look after it. That's why we have to look after it. You know? Yes. Yeah. And with technology advancements, I'm sure that that has greatly aided in being able to do a lot of these studies and, and research and, and find new species of sharks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, communication has just got so much better. So yesterday morning, I was in a Zoom call with some kids from California who we did been doing a research project with. So my PhD student was in some other suburb of Brisbane and one of the students was up in Sacramento and the other one down in La Jolla uh, near San Diego. Yeah. And we were just having this interaction and sharing the paper we were working on on the screen and editing it on the screen. So, you know, how fast is that? In the old days, you know, if I was asking questions of a scientist, either the Smithsonian or, um, in the UK, the Natural History Museum in, in London, I'd be writing a letter and then I'd be lucky to see a response in a month. All right, right. now, boom, you know, <clears throat> I'm at it, we're editing, you know, it's crazy, it's crazy. So the, the pace of science has really picked up because of technology, I think. Yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, yeah, great time to be doing science, yeah. It, it is, it is, and that, that makes sense. I never even really thought about that, that the speed has increased because of technology. I mean, it makes sense, but it's something that we take for granted. You know, we're so used to it in, in our day and age. Um, yeah, you young, you young, you young people. <laughs> you're all used to. You're all used to it being very immediate, but in the old days, 
So in the old days, they used to have like stencil letters onto diagrams and draw graphs physically on graph paper. Yeah. <coughs> and then post them and then post them off to the journal. Now you do, you know, Excel or whatever else, what other program, you, you boom, there's a graph it's and there's, done. you can take a photograph of it. It's, oh man, it's just so different. So yeah, enjoy the moment, but uh, make sure you spend time away from your computer looking at stuff because. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's important to, to walk away and stand up and yes. see the world around us. Think, so, explore. Th so yeah. the, the small sharks, so bull sharks obviously have quite a reputation about um, their, their personality, the, their behaviors. How are the little sharks? Have you, have, do you notice that with these smaller species that they're just as uh, individualized in their behavior or do they all oh, have the same that's type of a, behavior? <laughs> That's a, that's a very good question. Um, I, I've got a passion for stingrays, oh. I'll tell you. So I've probably more, spent more time with stingrays than I have with, um, with the epaulets and their allies. Yeah. And they have, they, they have little personalities, okay? They're the cutest things on the planet. So there's a they thing are. called the masked ray. Um, Neo, Neo trigon coolii is the version we have here so neo try n-e-o-t-r-y-g-o-n is the genus and the mast rays they're beautiful they've got like zorro masks oh yeah right? these little sting little stingrays and you know we i one of the branches of research i do is an electro reception and one of the questions we've had is about you know to what extent how how these stingrays are able to detect prey underneath buried prey yeah. And how sensitive is that? Can they discriminate between species? Can they, can they discriminate size versus depth? All these sorts of questions. And to do that, you have to have these rays in little, you know, in aquaria. Yeah. And they're so beautiful, you know, they're so beautiful. They learn so quickly about where the food is coming from. And they come up and they, they kind of like being, I mean, I should say this, <laughs> they, they kind of like being stroked, and, you know, so yeah. whether it's something that just, you know, triggers their electroreceptive system that they find a positive feedback. I'm not sure, but no, they're the cutest things on the planet. I'm they're like sure they're really cutting. intelligent. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, really. They're so they're great things. So the little sharks are in the same sort of mold, you know, they are uh, pretty robust animals as I talk about in the MOOC and yeah, just, yeah, cute as, and they learn so quickly. It's, it's, uh, they're wonderful things. I greatest respect for sharks and their allies. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, as as do I. I think that they're just they're fascinating creatures. Absolutely fascinating. They are. Um, they are. How yeah. about how many species of <coughs> sharks and rays does Australia have? Oh. You know, <laughs> obviously, I know um, there's there's a crap ton of different species, but that are yeah, 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 species. yeah. No, we got a we got a bunch. It depends how you you see that numbers changing all the time. Um, yeah. I mean, if, if this, my student, Fami, who's a wonderful chap from Indonesia, who's working on the sh sharks at the moment, we're talking about taking a single species and we think we've found maybe three species within that group. Yeah. So you've just tripled the number for one shark, right? So yeah. as we look more closely at things that have limited dispersal and unable to distribute as widely so things that live in shallow water are limited by continental boundaries this is a very evasive answer to your question i'm sorry but basically <laughs> no, okay. i got another follow-up question to it so it's, it's difficult it's difficult to know all right yeah. but if i was forced to take a stab at it i'd say between three and four hundred okay uh that'd be a rough that'd be an absolute guess because i don't really you know it's not so i wake up in the morning and say well you know what's our yeah. what's our number up today how many <laughs> species do we have today Oh, we have another one. So, <laughs> add it to the list. <laughs> yeah, yeah, add it to the list. So, and it depends how you go, right? So the species concept is a challenging thing in itself. Knowing when to draw the line between something that its genetics tell you it's a different animal, but it's more morphologically, you can't pick it apart. So if you can't pick it apart morphologically, how do you then manage that entity in terms of a fishery, for example, yeah? Yeah. If you can't discriminate between two things that you know as species by their genetics, you can't distinguish them morphologically. How do you ask a fisherman to make a decision about what species 
he, he or her has caught, you know? So, yeah. uh, right. well, and that was going to be my, my next question. And it's probably yeah. going to be a very in-depth question, flying but fish. I guess an easy, right? Floating mug. <laughs> flying fish, flying fish. <laughs> it's art. I paid for it. Yes. <laughs> um, what, what yeah, Karen, sorry. Easy way to explain to people of, of my art world brain. How do you, how does a scientist, you know, like you're saying, when you, when you have a species, but then you find like there's little, you know, species within that, you know, you break them up. How does that, you know, you're saying like, where do you draw the line, but how does that get determined? You know, you, you <laughs> find the hammerhead, but then yeah. what factors do you look at between, you know, genetics and then location and behavior or what goes into it to say, we now have five. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, we're struggling with that one. So it's, it's about, you know, morphology has to be some of the answer there. Um, it's all very well to discriminate something based on genetics, but as I said, it's almost irrelevant at the, at the functional level because you can't, if you can't dis distinguish something morphologically, yeah. then it's of no, you know, it's a little practical value, it's academic value. So very careful observation. So drawing something is a good way to get a better understanding of it all right so this is where the intersection between art and science comes if you patiently sit down and draw something you get to know its form its it um its morphology the relationships between different parts of the animal really really well and that's really that intersection yeah and then scientists tend to break that down by going okay well here's point a and point b there's the tip of the nose the back of the eye let's measure that distance and let's do that for a whole bunch of this group of what we think is one shark and then what we think is another and then you can find some quite obscure dimensions potentially or, or measurements that allow you to discriminate it so that's that's one process the individual variability if you look at humans all right think about the variability in the size and the yes. morphology of humans yeah. you know you'd have a much easier time splitting, a, splitting different species of sharks <laughs> yeah. than you would trying to, trying to say that humans are all one species, right? It's like crazy. Like, yeah. If they based it on hair, then you and I would be different phyla, <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, that, I, that's, a, that's a great answer for a very uh, in-depth, loaded question that I asked. <laughs> yeah, no, I kind so, of need to ask a difficult one, yeah. But we think about... You know, the other thing is opportunity. I mentioned about reproduction earlier, about how yeah. if you're a shark that's very large and mobile, making di traveling distances of thousands of kilometers or miles, then it's likely that your genetics will be spread much more widely than something that, you know, hatches an egg and then the little one hatches out of the egg as a miniature adult and just basically stays around where it, near where it's born. So we also look at, the opportunity for speci speciation as well. That's, yeah. that's so fascinating. Where deep oceans occur, current directions, a whole bunch of stuff goes into yeah. making that assessment. And I'm, you know, once again with technology, that has to help massively because I'm sure that there's databases or areas that you can tap into versus you know having paper logs of you know I've I've done this in Australia, someone's done this in China and England. It's somewhere i'm sure that there's a, an area that holds this oh yeah yeah so you can and you know the communication we spoke about earlier between yeah. scientists now is is so immediate you have a question you can just email them and say look can we zoom yeah. and have a chat share data whatever else or i'm thinking about you know this is a thing i'm working on what do you think about this and the response is immediate yeah so no, the, the, the speed of communication is great in terms of that. It's, the, the way we exchange data and seek other opinions, yeah? Yeah, that makes sense. In terms of conservation, are there any, you know, obviously the major issues with sharks right now is, is finning and, and overfishing. Is Australia having those similar issues? Are there other issues or do you see populations kind of steady or increasing, decreasing? uh yeah it's a very it's a good question uh we've got pretty good protections in australia for our shark resources so one of the other things i do is advise the queensland government on fisheries 
um, with colleagues. Um, and one of the restrictions on fisheries here is they're not allowed to take a shark over 1.5 meters, which is causing yeah. some folks to think there are lots of big sharks around. Um, there's also a new rule come in that you're allowed to land sharks, that is catch them for commercial purposes, yeah. but that the fins have to remain attached to it. So you know what species has been caught uh, because it's a quite different thing to identify shark sharks from the fins alone as yeah. opposed to the animal as a whole so no we've got some great protections for sharks over here um we also do some silly things we do shark meshing of beaches which is just to kill sharks and other things dolphins turtles and we also have uh, baited line approaches to reduce the shark population yeah. to supposedly protect surfers but yeah it's, I, i'm not a fan of that program yeah, no, and any time that I've seen that kind of been in use or implemented, it doesn't seem to make sense to me. You know, the, but. Yeah, then, no, the, the, yeah, it's, it's aimed at, <clears throat> it's not aimed at like closing off the beach. If you put a net around a beach, you know, to stop all large animals accessing that beach, that would be a thing. But to hang a net specifically designed to kill large animals and then tangling whales, turtles dolphins you know as well as some big majestic sharks that wouldn't hurt a fly well they would yeah. hurt a fly but they, <laughs> you know what i mean you know when we get when you go into the sea it's a risk proposition it's more likely that you will drown than be eaten by a shark exactly it's more likely you'll get run over driving home from the beach than you'll be eaten by a shark so it's this irrational fear of a thing where you're entering its territory and it's just crazy and we've yeah. got all the technology now with drones to go and survey beaches to shout you know send warnings out to people yes. or <coughs> individuals who are out there you know the drone comes down and says like you know there's a shark behind you you might want to go back to the shore <laughs> and the swimmer go oh, i know i love sharks i think i'll be fine or you know yeah. so you can make decisions about this stuff. Well, we've got yeah, ai technology the yeah, we've got AI that can identify things. So, you know, you can have an autonomous drone that's able to identify the size and species of a shark, yeah. determine the potential for lethality, and then go and warn individuals about it. I mean, why are we killing things in nets? It just doesn't yeah. doesn't I, make sense. So I I'm like, you know. I agree. It's, it's their home. Yeah, it's um, not like the net goes up and it says, for sharks only, and the sea turtle sees it and, and swims away. That's not how it That's how it right, works. yeah. Uh, Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, you see a distressed mother whale, you know, next to oh. a baby that's tangled in the net. And the trauma that those animals go through, it's it's not worth it. It's it's, it's worth heartbreaking. It. It's literally yeah, it is. absolutely it heartbreaking. Is. Yeah. And see yeah, see, you know, a majestic animal like a shark that you know, sharks had their origin back in the Devonian you know, 400 million years ago. Yeah. And over time, they refined morphology and their behavior and their senses and everything to this pinnacle of predation in the sea. And to see something like that tangled up in a net, drowned, it's horrible. It's not, not yeah. something we should be counting. You know, this is, yeah. Yeah. On the flip side, they're <clears throat> they are a resource, okay. So, but if you're going to take if you're going to take a resource like that, you have to use it all. You can't just like lock the fins off and say they're worth a lot of money, so I'll just sell them. Yeah. <clears throat> and I did a <clears throat> this student that's working on the little sharks. He did his masters with me, and he did it on uh, shark and ray fisheries in Indonesia. And over there, they take sharks. They take a lot of sharks and rays, yeah. but they use every bit of the animal every little bit of the animal every scrap is used they even have stuff called shark floss so if you wear a really? fairy floss or candy floss yeah i don't know it's like a sweet thing it comes on a stick it's all fluffy and it's made out of sugar that's whipped right yes so they have shark floss which is the you know you cook the cook the shark flesh dry it out and then tease it into these strands so it's like oh. a con not confection but you know yeah so, I'm, I'm, you know, we're, we're humans, we have to eat stuff. So I'm, yeah. I'm okay with that. 
what I'm not okay with is wastage. All right, saying this part of the animal's high value, so we'll just yeah. kill this animal just for this little bit. If you're going to take an animal's life, you need to respect it and use all of it to the utmost of your ability, is my yeah. view. Yeah, no, I, and I agree with that because there are some areas of the world that that is their, their only resource for food. You know, the main resource is mm -hmm. the ocean. They need yeah. the, the animals in that to live on. But I Absolutely. also feel, you know, we're also depleting. You know, at some point, species can't populate or reproduce at the rates that we're taking them. In some yeah, areas. that's why, yeah, absolutely, you're absolutely right. So you've yeah. got to look at the rate of reproduction, the rate of growth yeah. for those animals. And that's why we're working, that's why I'm working with the student farming on these um, bamboo sharks, all right? So they're a small species of shark, but they grow rapidly. They reproduce quite frequently. And it's our hope that folks in the Southeast Pacific you know, if they focus more on these smaller bodied sharks with a higher reproductive rate yeah. and take the pressure off the larger animals, that they'll be able to gain the food they require, but without the threat to the population. So that's where yes. we're sort of aiming at. You've got to be pragmatic. You know, you yes. can't, it's all well for us to sit on our, on our decks or on our, you know, our porches or in our lounge rooms and say, well, folks over there should be protecting X, Y, Z, their little patch of coral reef or what. They need to live, all right? Yeah. <laughs> they got to live. Right? I did a bunch of work in the Solomon Islands, which is north yeah. of here, in the tropics. And <clears throat> there are, you know, very few places I visit, the Solomons have roads. There's no supermarket function. You have to go down and catch. You either go up into the bush, bush and catch animals, or you go down to the sea and you find produce from the sea. Um, so it's all very well for us to pontificate about what others should do, but they have to live their lives, you know? So yeah. the, the, the trick is trying to work with them to find out what works best, yeah? How the sea can be as productive as it possibly can be for them to help, to help them and their children. Yeah, and, and, and working together, I think, is just, that's the key to any sort of conservation or saving our environments, you know? It's very easy mm -hmm. to be used to our lifestyle, but there's, you know, like you said, many parts of the world that that, that is their life. They they would look at our life and gladly point out the things that we're doing wrong, you know, using oh, yeah. plastic <laughs> straws or plastic bags. There's plenty of things that on our high yeah. we, we speak down to other environments, but working together, we can certainly come yeah. up with a you know, solution. We can. And we've got where we are, those of us in the developed world, by exploiting yeah. things for centuries and centuries you know we've decimated our forests we've cleaned our seas we you know and then for us to go piously into some remote community and say oh well you really should protect biodiversity right. here kiss, kiss, kiss. And they're looking at you going well i can't eat biodiversity <laughs> so, <laughs> you know biodiversity won't teach my children pay for school fees or yeah. kerosene to light my hut in the evening so yeah, we have to be, we have to seek partnerships with folks, find out what their needs, values, desires are, and then where they ask for input, then provide it, not to parachute in and say, close this reef or yeah, don't use that rain for us. Yeah, so yeah, it's a pretty, pretty precious, pretty precious perspective some of us have when it comes to <laughs> providing advice to others, you know? It, yeah. It, but it's also yeah. a skill though, you know, to be able to yeah. communicate and have that open mindset. I think 2020 we've seen across the board, uh, this year has been very weird. And mm -hmm. I think the most successful businesses and areas have been individuals and companies and organizations that have been able to think outside the box, you know, so we mm -hmm. can't be together. We can zoom. You know, we think that this area of the world should be doing X, Y, Z. We'll talk to them, communicate. It's, it's really coming together and thinking outside the box instead of in our, our world that we're in. No, the, the, yeah, the world that we used to inhabit. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah so I, I wrote a sign on my door before I left the university for the <laughs> like months of the outbreak of COVID. So I remember my last teaching day was March 13th. Wow. My birthday was March 15th. Oh. And so, and I was, that was the last time I was 
able to do in 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 class teaching to students yeah. so i remember it vividly but i wrote on my door uh, what i think it was advantage from adversity so yeah we the planet is suffering a strange thing at the moment but how can you use that experience to change the way you do things or reevaluate how you were doing things yeah and then use that in a positive sense so you know one can sit in the corner and cry or one can say this is the new reality and this is one this is how i'm going to get, take advantage of it and yeah I so mean, i think very positive perspective yeah so it's easy to you know, i spoke to kids yesterday you know in the states who i had a conversation with this guy in indiana you know and how school is still closed down over there and that's tough is you know I'm okay. I'm a hermit. All right. I'm quite happily yeah. like, dwelling in isolation. But for kids, it's, you know, communication and connection is really, really important. So yeah. finding meaningful ways of keeping that going during this challenging situation is important. And I think kids are creative, so they will come up with solutions to it using the available technology to make sure that continues. And, yeah. the, you know, you've got to stay positive you got to look for the opportunity. And I, you know, I'm, I'm a great believer that, that children will find a way. Yeah. I, I, they're our future, you know? Oh yeah, no, no, they're, yeah, they're, well, they're my present. Like my, uh, my grandson who's eight, I think he bought a kitten online the other day. So. <laughs> <clears throat> he accessed my PayPal somehow and I'm expecting a small cat to arrive at my front door. He's only eight. Right. And he somehow, he, got into my system did some searches and i think he bought a kitten online but that so. is that's the best thing that i've heard um in a long time hopefully it's a, it's an actual domesticated kitten and you're not going to be receiving a a baby wild you know oh yeah yeah <laughs> Someone's trying to have a cat. <laughs> so yeah so that you know that kind of so that was you know that was an experience i would never have had as a child all right so it's a yeah. This is new thinking and new ways of doing. And, but to see his innovation, the way he uses it, you know, he gets my iPad and basically fixes it for me. He swipes this, swipes that, double clicks something yeah. else. And I don't realize I've got all this rubbish on my, you know, so no bless. So children are finding new ways to do things and they've just got to stay strong and keep connected because there's a lot of negative pressure out there in the world. Yeah. And I think, you know, love needs to go around and, and nurture the little things, you know, during these tough times. So, yeah, yeah. I, if I you get a agree. chance to help a child, help a child, you know, always. Yeah, I agree with that. So what's one thing that you would like our audience to specifically know about um, Australia and its waters or, or sharks, something that we might not know, not having ever visited Australia or, or knowing that part of the world? Well, they're everywhere. <laughs> so if I was to, if someone was to visit me now, within two hours, I could show them the shark. Um, and be certain that I, I, I know where to go. I know how to look. And so they're there. And the, the thing is, it's not just the big things you hear about, right? The way the, you know, whale sharks, the great whites, the tigers. It's the other 90%, all right? The, yeah. the smaller sharks that we may not recognize or value as much. It's their relatives, things like the stingrays, the skates, the shovel nose sharks, the, the saw sharks. It's just, yeah, there's, there's a wonderful diversity in sharks and in Australia, it's a great place to see them. They are everywhere. And yeah, I just, if, if folks want to visit, tap me on the shoulder, I'll take you down. So sharks. <laughs> well, as soon as Australia opens, it has been on my bucket list to go to Australia. It's the one place in the entire world that I've always wanted to visit um, for various reasons, obviously sharks, but I'm also a, a huge fan of kangaroos. <laughs> Oh yeah, twenty yeah. minutes. Look, ten minutes from ten minutes from here. I mean, I'm in the city, right? Ten minutes yeah. from here, I can show you kangaroos. Oh. Easy, wild kangaroos, not 
not captive ones in a in a in a cage. Yeah. While kangaroos hopping around. It's, oh, that's just yeah, it's a oh, I love it's it. A, it's a marvelous place. Marvelous place. <laughs> well, you'll be hearing from me once the world opens. Yeah, all right, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> you come visit. You come visit. <laughs> Would love that. So, yeah. what's what's some exciting stuff coming up for you? Um, you know, despite things still being kind of shut down, I you're still moving and working. Yeah. Um, yeah, more science. So one of the other other things I do is work for a foundation that's looking after that um, is looking after Morton Bay. So nice. I do um, help with fundraising and organise the science around that. Um, so that's a passion because as we've you know as the world has kind of like got smaller. Yeah. Sorry, no, no, it got larger actually, massively larger. <clears throat> So planes used to be a frequent thing here with people flying, you know, Australia's a fairly rich country, flying all over the world. Yeah. Everyone's here. No one can leave. <laughs> and, as, and so there, so we, we, you know, we had this like epiphany about uh, doing things locally, right? So yeah. whereas people fly to Bali or Fiji or, where, you know, the US or wherever it might be, or Europe for a, now we're not. So folks are very much focused on local environments. And this is a great opportunity to get people focused on what's in their locale. Yeah. yeah? So yeah. if you're feeling if you're feeling miffed that the world has shut down a little bit, try and look at the flip side, the bright side of it. You get to know your local area much better. You get to appreciate it for its cultural values, for its wildlife values. And that's whether you're in a city or in the country, it doesn't matter. The stuff going on around you that matters. And I think use this time to refocus. It's like having, you know, like folks historically when the when travel was open had a massive horizon. The horizon was the planet. Now the horizon is not as great. And so use that, you, you know, refocus down to what's local and what's important. Get involved in something locally that, you know, supports your local environment or supports the well-being of children or furthers educational opportunities or whatever it is but you know use it positively you can sit yeah. in a corner and cry or you can get out and do something so get out yes. and do something mm -hmm. yes i love that's that. where i'm at <laughs> <laughs> i i think mean, that's a fantastic message because a lot of change and impact can happen in your local community local immediate circles you know, I, I've been, you know, obviously this year, uh, specifically in the U.S., we are very divided on many, many topics. Everything, I'm sure, mm -hmm. even down to popcorn or potato chips. But yeah. you can make a difference in your own community. You know, whether it is, you know, like you said, working with children, volunteering, um, being a part of a foundation, being on a board, you can do things to help and make an impact, you know, versus traveling yeah. somewhere and trying to do it elsewhere. You can do it with the people that you know and that are your neighbors. Yes. Yes. So you may have overlooked previously. Yes. So, exactly. Yeah. So think local at the moment. Yes. And then COVID will do its thing. Who knows where it goes? But yeah. Yeah. Advantage from adversity. Look yeah. for how you can help in your area yeah i think that is a great great encompassing message for this whole interview i think that this is this has been really wonderful chatting with you thank you so no, much I've, um for i've had a ball time. thanks jessica it's, yeah. it's, good. it's all good i've got <laughs> to go to another zoom with a student to talk about sailfish now so it's very exciting awesome. <laughs> Well, um, I, I appreciate you letting me ask some questions that weren't on the initial question thing that I sent. And you, um, hopefully we can do another interview in the future. We can talk maybe specifically more about some other species and, and whatnot. Yeah. But um, this has been fantabulous. So um, mm. thank you for everyone who's watched this and please share the video. And once again, happy Ocean Friday. And thank you again, Ian, and we will talk to you again soon. <laughs> yeah, and no, I'm happy to chat soon, Jessica. Wonderful. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Cheers. <laughs>